88.9 WLRY, live online, WLRY.org. Our privilege to have a very special guest with us, joining us, Eddie DeGarmo of DeGarmo and Key. And uh, Eddie, thanks for talking to us tonight. How are you guys up there in Ohio land? We are doing fine and uh, been following your career. In fact, when I came to know the Lord, you guys were one of the first bands that uh, I was directed to and that I listened to, to Garmo and Key. How'd you guys get together? We're talking late 70s, right, when you guys formed? Uh, we did form the band in, actually it was 1972. Oh, okay. It, took us, it just took us a while to get get our first album out yeah uh dana key and i were were neighborhood friends best friends growing up we met in the very first grade on the playground he he had a gang of minions around him <laughs> and said he wanted me to join his gang and i, I completely refused and said i was going <laughs> to form my own gang and so that's how we grew up kind of being oh com- best friends and competitors and rivals and brothers all at the same time yeah. Played music from from the time we were in the sixth grade together, and both uh, became Christians right before we graduated high school. Me a day before him, and uh, we just started writing songs that reflected, you know, our faith. We didn't know anything about a Christian music industry or those kinds of things yet. Yeah. We were just doing what we felt like God wanted us to do and started playing around the Mid-South. This was in 1972, and we called ourselves the Christian Band because we didn't think it was appropriate to take a name, you know. So uh, over the course of the next three or four years, things heated up for us, and some other folks uh, discovered us that had national prominence and record companies and that sort of thing. Uh, Pat Boone was the one that gave us our start in mm-hmm. Christian music in 1976, and we signed with him in early 77 and started working on our first album, which was released, I want to say it was January 78. Okay, so, okay. It was all through that era. Well, and you said uh, weren't trying to be a part of the Christian music industry. Was there a Christian music industry? It was in its infancy at that time, wasn't it? Yeah, it was it was a fledgling uh, industry. You know, that's that's kind of a long answer, frankly. But uh, somebody had brought us, brought Dana and I, a copy of Larry Norman's "Only Business mm. This Planet." Yeah, somewhere in the summertime of 1972, mm-hmm. and it was on Capitol Records, which was a mainstream company, and so we still didn't know anything about it, uh, necessarily a. Christian music business, you know, because it was it was so contained and so small at that point in time, right. and mostly centered around, you know, hymns at church and those those kinds of songs. There wasn't really anything much in in the contemporary, and certainly not in the rock music arena. And all that kind of grew up around us. And uh, I was glad to be a part. I think that Christian music has made a, a significant difference in the lives of a lot of folks. Amen. I was honored to be able to be a part of that in the beginning years. But yes, to answer your question, there really wasn't much of an industry. Yeah, you guys were certainly trailblazers, uh, bringing that to the forefront. And I imagine, did people sometimes at shows, Eddie, were, were did people not know what to expect, or were they taken by surprise? Well, in the early years, there was a lot of controversy around whether or not it was even appropriate to play rock music and sing about Jesus. Right, you know? yeah. And uh, we, I mean, I've had things thrown at me, you know, oh my I've had goodness. tomatoes thrown at me. Oh really? My gosh, I've had, oh yes, I've had record burnings. I, you know, we got unplugged at several universities around the, the South and those Wow. And, you know, oh yeah, it was controversial. Um but the interesting thing is that is the controversy was also the fuel that that God used to to get the publicity going. I mm-hmm. mean, everybody wanted to talk about it, and you know, all the young people were like wanting to go. Maybe it was a tad rebellious in their minds. It, who knows? But 
you know, we would set up and hundreds of young people would show up and then, you know, some church leaders in those days would show up and shut us down. I mean, that happened a lot. Um, and, you know, I wasn't cynical about it then. I almost felt like it was a badge of honor, if you will. I know that sounds rather weird, but it, it felt like that, hey, you know, we're doing the right thing. We're certainly not the first first folks to get shut down for what they think or what they say. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we were seeing people come to Christ. And so how do you reconcile those two together? And I, I often thought, I mean, is this wrong? Is it right? I mean, what kind of music does God like? I mean, that's that's some deep water. You know, does he, does he like <laughs> does yeah. he like Chinese music more than he likes American music? Make you know? a joyful noise, so, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and Psalms 150 says, make a joyful noise, and we did our best at that one. So, Yeah. Again, Eddie DeGarmo uh, joining us. A- another controversy, and it, it really seems odd now when you look at MTV, but I understand DeGarmo and Key actually got a video banned from MTV. Is that correct? We we were privileged to be the first Christian group to be played on MTV in heavy rotation in the mid-'80s. We had a song called 666, right. which was the story of the Antichrist. And, you know, the, uh, the fellow that we hired to direct our video had done a lot of mainstream work, and we wanted to make a, a video that was appropriate for the MTV audience because that's who we wanted to reach in those it was, you know, it was a youth audience, and sure. that's who we wanted to reach in those days. So we made a video that had a, a full body burn scene in it that, I mean, the, the, the story behind it was it was the Antichrist set himself on fire to show that he couldn't be destroyed. That was the deal. Mm-hmm. And, of course, it was a stuntman in a, in a burn suit. And I mean, we've seen that happen a thousand times in motion pictures. But sure. It was during a period of time where MTV was really under the microscope for promoting violence and other things, and so they banned our video, and that turned out to be another really good thing for us because the Wall Street Journal picked it up and ran it on the front page. CBS Evening News talked about it. The Today Show talked about it. And it just turned out to be another thing that really worked to our benefit. And we actually ended up compromising with MTV and making another version for them that they aired for a long time. So, Wow, very good. And well, tell me a little bit about your early music influences. What, what were you listening to when you were growing up? Well, growing up in Memphis, Tennessee, which was a music town, in those days, we had a couple of really large independent music companies that were mostly centered around soul music. You know, artists like Wilson Pickett mm-hmm. and Otis Redding and Sam and Dave and Al Green and that sort of thing. But there was also a rock side of those uh, studios with music by the Box Tops and uh, Sam the Sham that did the song Willy Bully. Sure. We all know that song. Yeah. And so we we grew up playing a hybrid of soul and rock music. And when the British invasion happened, you know, Dana and I were huge fans of just, you know, the normal bands that were popular. Every Everything from the Beatles to the Stones to Led Zeppelin to Jimi Hendrix, you know, and Janis Joplin. And then, you know, the, the more sophisticated sounds of the, I call them cape bands, because you, you're supposed to wear a cape when you play their music. Bands <laughs> like Yes or Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, so they they influenced us all, and, the, you know, it was the early days of the electronic keyboards, and I really got into those, as well as the Hammond B3. And so we, we kind of, oh, fused all that together, we think, and came up with this, sound that was uniquely ours that I've, I've heard people describe it like eating barbecue with fine wine you know mm. it's kind of a weird mixture if you think about it that way a good way so, to put it yeah yeah but it was uniquely ours and uh you know that's first several albums really reflected that so 
Well, back during the, say, late 70s or 80s, you remember, you know, how many shows you guys were doing a year? Were you guys on the road a lot? Uh, in the early years, and when I say that, 77, 78, we probably only played 40 or 50 times a year. You know, we were bivocational, meaning that we had to hold down other jobs to mm, figure yeah. out a way to pay the utility bills while we were playing music. And uh, things got really busy for us in 1979 when we teamed up with Amy Grant, oddly enough, and toured with her for a couple years, 79 and 80, and started probably playing as much as 120, 130 times a year which was, it, you know, a heavy travel schedule because, you know, when you factor in travel days and days off and that sort of thing, we were traveling, you know, 180 days a year anyway. Yeah. So that was our life all the way through the 80s yeah. and early 90s. Was that travel by uh, tour bus primarily? Well, I mean, once we could afford one, absolutely. But in the early years, I mean, my gosh, we, we traveled in everything you could fathom from <laughs> station wagons to box trucks to, you know, bread vans to, you know, you name it. You had to be careful when you, you know, went to the bathroom for sure. <laughs> I, was early when, I mean, it was, it was everything you're thinking and more. Yeah. But, you know, we were on a mission. I mean, we felt right. very compelled to do what we were doing, and it was an adventure, and it was a mission. And no regrets and no complaints about that. But it took us a few years to afford to travel, and certainly what you see today with the with the artists and the tour buses and that sort of thing. Again, Eddie DeGarmo is uh, joining us. Well, let's fast forward to uh, Forefront Records. I take it was that after DeGarmo and Key that uh, you joined up with Forefront? Well, it was a little of both. Okay. Uh, we formed... I formed Forefront with a group of partners in 1987, which was um, seven years before we retired from d and And really what I, I was wanting to accomplish uh, was to make a home for artists that played an edgier sound that wanted to reach a youthful audience. And so we formed the label. I didn't even tell anybody I owned the label until five years after we formed it because I was still in the in the throes of a you know creative career with Carmon Key, right? And you know, Forefront grew exponentially in the '90s and actually became the very largest Christian music independent company in the world. It just, you know, with groups like DC Talk and Audio Adrenaline and Jeff Moore in the Distance, and Big Kit Revival and Skillet. And, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, the list goes on and on. And we just had some really good fortune to work with some fantastic artists that God blessed us in knowing, and things exploded for us. And that's where I went when I retired from D&K. And it was... I actually told Dana that I was going to leave the group in 1992, and it took us about 18 months to wind things down because we had a lot of concerts on the books and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, did you uh, do a farewell tour with the band? Well, we never called it that. Okay, frankly, uh, we you know knew that we were winding down as early as 1992, and as I mentioned, it took about. 18 months to two years to, to wind everything down. Our last major tour uh, was the Heated Up Tour that we did with Jeff Moore in the Distance uh, based around our record that came out in 92, 93 called Heated Up. Our last album was called Two Extremes and we never toured that album. Um, we did do a tour called the Acoustic Cafe which was kind of in the throes of when MTV unplugged was okay. so popular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we took a little a little group with us called Big Tent Revival that helped us with that tour. And that was the last full tour we did. We did a few a few concerts after that. But our very last concert that we played was in the summer of nineteen ninety four at a music festival outside of Buffalo, New York called Kingdom Bound. And uh, I remember it well. It was a great day, but it was the last concert that we played. 
as De Carmo and Key. Now we did we did do a few things in the early two thousands, late two thousands, you know, kind of as people would ask us to do stuff, but very few. Now do you still perform today? I have not performed publicly. I mean I've sang a song here and a song there, but I've not really performed publicly since Dana passed away in two thousand ten. Mm-hmm. So, so what are you uh, doing these days? Well, after Forefront, I went on and uh, became the president of a company called EMI Christian Music, that uh, their music publishing division, and I ran that for 14 years. We became Capital Christian Music Publishing, uh, and we were a huge company, a global company that... Uh, I had 325 songwriters that we managed. Writers like Chris Tomlin, and Toby Mack, and Mark Hall from Casting Crown. Wow, yeah. You know, John Foreman from Switchfoot, and Stacey Arico, and Matt Redman. You know, and we we formed a, a website called worshiptogether.com, which now I think reaches over a million uh, worship ministers around the world. And I did that for the last 14 years of my career, and I retired the day I turned 60 years old. And I just, you know, felt like that God had allowed me to put my flag at the top of that mountain, and it was time to walk away. So that was three years ago, and I left. And in the last three years, this is this is kind of a whirlwind. I went back to college and finished my degree. Well, congratulations! That's awesome. I prom- I- I promised my mother I'd do that when I quit in 1976. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I did. And I, I've, I've written a book uh, that'll be published next summer that's, you know, just our journey and, and my journey and my family's journey through all of this. So uh, done that and, you know, done a little bit of this and a little bit of that consulting, but not anything full time. Yeah, well, that is great, and certainly uh, look forward to to that book. Do uh, you have a release date on that? You know, there is one. I don't know the exact date, but okay. it's sometime in mid June. And uh, okay, you know, I've been working on the thing for a couple of years now because, my gosh, I first thing I wrote was just way too long <laughs> to fit inside a book. So I've had to trim it down and just try to tell the best of the best, but. I'm getting pretty close. And this is the uh, story of, of DeGarmo and Key primarily? Well, it, I mean, that's part of it. It's it's really my story and my wife's story and uh, the DeGarmo and Key story, the Forefront story, the Capital Christian Music story, yeah, and just my journey. And it's, it's you know, a little more than a memoir, I think, in that uh, my publisher calls it a mentoring memoir. You know, because it's it's got all the stuff that worked for me and all the stuff that didn't work for me. Mm-hmm. And the lessons I learned along the way. And, you know, hopefully folks can read that and, and learn from it. Maybe something, you know, that can, that can work in their lives, because that's my desire. Yeah, absolutely. So we can look forward to that coming out in June, and we'll, uh, we'll keep everybody posted about that. Eddie DeGarmo, again, our special guest. This has been a blessing. Thanks so much for taking the time out to talk to us today. Well, it's it's always good to talk to folks like you, Mike, and you guys are out there doing it, and I just appreciate you so much, and I'm honored that you would want to talk about all this with me and appreciate you airing this.